I'm just gonna redo the intro. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Nathan Brown. I'm an Android developer at Outsoft. Uh, and today we're going to talk delegates. So there are these things in Kotlin, as you know already, uh, that seem like language features at first, uh, but uh, later on it turns out that they are just clever uses of, uh, of uh, simpler language features uh, that you could uh, have achieved yourself as well. So uh, examples of this are the two keyword, which allows you to create a pair of whatever two things, the with uh, function keyword, uh, whatever it might be, uh, that you can pass something as an argument, and uh, within the uh, block that follows it, you get in the context of that object and can, uh, for, for example, read properties of it. Then there is use, uh, which, is a, which is a slightly more complex uh, feature than the others. Uh, this is Kotlin's uh, replacement for Java's uh, try with resources block, so you can call it on anything that's a closable, uh, use it within the block that follows, and it will be closed for you automatically uh, when the block ends, uh, handling exceptions and everything. And then there is lazy, which is uh, a way of declaring a property uh, so that the uh, code that you use to initialize it isn't run when the property itself is created. So if this property is inside of a class, uh, this uh, initialization code doesn't run when the uh, class uh, is being created. Instead, it will be uh, computed when you first uh, access this property, and this value will then be cached. So for any subsequent accesses, uh, it doesn't have to be recomputed. You will just get the uh, already initialized value. Um, and we are going to focus on this last feature, uh, which uh, some of it is an actual feature, and some of it is uh, just uh, part of the standard library. Uh, the actual feature here is the by keyword, which uh, is uh, telling the compiler uh, that you are trying to uh, serve a property by uh, something more complex than just a custom getter or setter. Uh, and actually, Swift, if you have dabbled in Swift, uh, many people might be uh, working on both uh, mobile platforms. Uh, Swift actually has support for uh, lazy uh, properties as well. However, uh, it doesn't have uh, quite the delegate support that Kotlin has, but there are proposals to uh, bring this uh, same feature set to Swift. So what does Kotlin have? Uh, what's really happening here uh, is that after the by keyword, you have to provide an instance of a special class that can be used to back this uh, property. So uh, whenever the value of pi is being read, this read will be uh, delegated to the delegate class, uh, which will uh, serve as uh, the implementation of this property. Why are delegates uh, required or uh, useful in the first place? Well, let's take uh, this class where uh, we are uh, now in initializing two uh, constants, one of them being pi, the other being e, or Euler's number, uh, just as an example. And you can see that both of these are implemented just with custom getters without uh, using lazy itself. So these are the manual implementations of lazy that we would have to perform if we didn't have delegate support. And you can clearly see the code duplication here. Uh, both of these will have a private uh, backing property, which uh, stores null by default and will be initialized later on. And then the public facing API of the class is these two, two properties with custom getters, which check whether the uh, private backing property has, be has been initialized. If it hasn't been, then it performs some computation and assigns the value to the uh, private uh, backing property, and then finally it returns the value of this uh, backing property. So we would uh, ideally like to uh, not write this code every time we need a lazy property, and this uh, sort of extraction of a getter or setter logic is what uh, delegates can provide for you. Getting back to this example where uh, we have uh, delegated a lazy behavior to a class. Let's see how we could implement this ourselves, even though uh, you have seen that uh, with the lazy keyword function, whatever it is still, uh, it's actually part of the standard library. So we have already uh, figured out that we'll need a class for this. This class clear clearly takes a function as its parameter, as uh, seen by the curly braces that we are passing to its constructor. 
Uh, this lambda will uh, take no parameters and return something of type t. We are making this class generic, of course, so that we can't just initialize uh, doubles with it, but any uh, generic type can be uh, initialized lazily. Then uh, there needs to be a, a very specific method uh, in this class. This, is, uh, this uh, signature is defined by convention in Kotlin. Uh, you need to uh, conform to this exact signature so that uh, this class can be used as a delegate. Uh, it has a couple of parameters, uh, one of which we'll <coughs> look at later. But the important part is that it, of course, needs to return uh, something of type t, which uh, in this case will be something that's a double. Then we'll do the same thing in this class as we've uh, seen with the uh, custom getter example. So uh, what used to be a backing property is now just a property since we are in just a class. And then the uh, code that was in the getter originally, the custom getter, goes into the get value method. So we, again, check if this property is null. If it's not, we run the initializer code. And finally, we return this uh, perhaps cached value. And this is a very basic but already working implementation of the lazy delegate. And if we uh, run this a couple times, you'll see that the first time around, it takes quite a bit of time as the uh, whole computation, which uh, approximates pi, uh, needs to be performed. And then the second time around, it's much, much, much faster as uh, we are essentially just performing a null check and reading the value of a, a single field. Uh, we would like to now get back to the original syntax that the standard library has provided for us. The first thing that stands out is these uh, parentheses, which uh, we didn't have with the uh, or original lazy implementation. Uh, the good news is that this is a constructor call, which in Kotlin isn't that much different from any other function call. So uh, as with any uh, Kotlin function, if we have a trailing lambda parameter, uh, so the last parameter of the function is a lambda, we can uh, move it outside of these parentheses and even drop the parentheses uh, when the parameter list becomes empty. So we can uh, jump to this syntax. But of course, what we really wanted to get is this, uh, which uh, the standard library has provided uh, already. Well, uh, there is an rather obvious, and pardon my pun, but lazy solution to uh, getting here, which would be, of course, renaming our class lowercase lazy. Uh, so this is one way to do it. The other way is to keep the uh, normal upper camel case uh, usual class name and introduce a factory function that can create instances of this class for us. This will be generic, take the same parameter as the class's constructor and just give us an instance uh, <laughs> passing on the initializer's value. Uh, so this is a working basic implementation of lazy. It's not quite as powerful as the standard library implementation, so you wouldn't want to use this instead of that. However, uh, um, sorry, uh, so what the standard library has uh, on our implementation is it uh, supports uh, thread safety, so it can synchronize uh, the initialization so that different threads don't uh, initialize your property uh, several times, and uh, it actually supports nullable properties as well. Uh, if, you can, uh, if you have noticed, uh, we are using null to mark the uninitialized backing property, so if our initializer lambda were to return null itself, uh, then it would be run every time that uh, this property is accessed, while the standard library implementation has a very clever solution uh, so that uh, the lazy computation may return null, and uh, that can be stored in it as well. All right, so that was our uh, introduction to delegates. And now we are going to move on to Crate, which is a shared preferences library that we have created. Uh, who are Android developers uh, here today? OK, so that's most people. Uh, but there are some people who aren't doing Android. Uh, what you need to know about shared, pre shared preferences to understand this uh, library is that it's a very simple key value store. You can use strings as your keys, and you can store primitive values in it, so Booleans, integers, and the like. And our library is wrapping this, of course, using delegates. Let's get to the code. Uh, so uh, create itself at the code level is just an interface, and anything can be a crate as long as it has a shared preferences property in it. We do provide an abstract base class that makes it easier to implement this interface. 
Uh, this base class requires you to pass in a context, which of course is uh, rather easy to come by on Android. And it implements uh, the interface overriding the single required property and fetching a shared preferences instance <laughs> using the context that it has received. Uh, now I'm going to split things in two and you'll see the library code on the bottom of the slide and then uh, we are going to uh, use it in another module uh, called app for the example's sake, uh, which will contain the client code accessing our library. The basic usage of the library will look something like this. We'll in, uh, we are using this simple create base class and uh, extending it with our own class. And then for each property that you wish to store in shared preferences, you would declare uh, a property inside your class and delegate all of these to things that the library provides. We'll see uh, how we can implement these. I would just uh, like to give you a preview in advance so that you know the syntax that we are trying to uh, eventually get to. And of course, the important part of this uh, whole delegate thing is that delegates are very transparent about what they do, uh, or rather opaque, I suppose. Uh, the point is that you can't see what's happening behind these delegates uh, from the client code. So you can read and write these properties as if they were uh, just a Boolean and a, an integer, which are in memory inside your class. But in reality, they will be backed by our library and saved to shared preferences persistently. All right, so that's just a preview of the library. And now let's see how we may implement uh, these uh, delegates that you have seen there for a second. What we will still need is a class that inherits from simple crate. So uh, this will be the same as before. And we'll look at just one example, which is saving an integer uh, using our library. We do know that we'll be using delegates, so we'll be uh, delegating this single property to something, but we don't have any classes for this in our library code just yet. Uh, to emphasize it, the usage will uh, still look like uh, writing or reading a real integer, even though it will be uh, saved in shared preferences. So what we uh, know is that we need a class here. Uh, we'll call this indelegate, and it has two dependencies. One of these will be the shared preferences instance that it uses for storage, and the other one is the key which it will uh, associate whatever integer it stores uh, with. Inside this class, uh, we'll need to now define two methods. As uh, before with lazy, we had a val, so a read-only property. Uh, we'll now uh, need to both read and write values to uh, this delegate. So we have both of these uh, methods here. You see that these signatures are very similar, uh, still these uh, very mysterious properties uh, in the beginning, but then the main point is that get value has to return an integer and that set value receives an integer as a parameter. The implementation is very, very simple, even if you have never seen the shared preferences API before. For getting the value, we are uh, asking shared preferences to give us the integer that's stored <coughs> with the given key. And as for setting a value, it's uh, just slightly more involved uh, it has this uh, transactional API. You have to start editing the instance, then you can perform your uh, edits. So in this case, sorry, in this case, uh, putting a single value in it with the key that we have received as our constructor parameter, and finally applying these edits so that they actually get uh, persisted. Uh, so with this, we can already start using our library. We could publish it like this, and clients could already be storing integers. Uh, by delegating to an indelegate instance. They have to provide the two parameters uh, that we had. The first one is very easy to provide since when you're inside of a crate, you have access to the shared preferences that's stored inside it. This is the single thing that a crate must contain. So you can just write down shared preferences and you'll get an instance of it. And then for the key that you use for storage, you can just uh, use a uh, simple string. We can improve on this, uh, having learned from lazy. Uh, factory functions seem like a good idea in general for uh, delegates, so we'll introduce one. And there's something special about uh, this specific uh, factory function in that it's an extension on the create type. So uh, what do we gain by making it an extension? 
for one, it will only be available inside create instances. So uh, you can't use this uh, function when you are not in a crate, when you are in a completely unrelated class. And uh, for example, it won't pollute your auto-completion results uh, if uh, it's not applicable. The other uh, gain here is that while the class that we were using before in the client code had two parameters, this factory function needs only one. Uh, since it's an extension on crate, it can access the shared preferences that crate is storing, so it only needs the key uh, as its parameter. So our client code simplifies to this, which is a lot friendlier to use. All right. Uh, so yet again, we are at a stable point with the development of our library. We could release this, people could start using it. There is, however, something to uh, note. Uh, while we did provide this new uh, easy to use uh, and convenient API, the old API is still available to our clients uh, due to this class still being public. We never really meant for this to be public uh, when, after we introduced the factory function. It's the concrete uh, implementation which clients actually don't need to uh, know or care about. So there is a uh, straightforward solution to fixing this, which is to make the class internal. Uh, the internal visibility modifier, uh, of course, is unique to Kotlin, is in that it doesn't exist in Java. And what it does is restricts the use of the given declaration to the module that it's in. So with our example of two modules, you could only use this uh, class now in the uh, library code, but not outside of it. Uh, while we are at uh, visibility modifiers, we also might want to do this. Uh, so what we've done here is marked all of our uh, public API uh, explicitly public. Uh, this is just a code change and it doesn't change any of the behavior or the semantics of our code. As you probably know, every declaration in Kotlin is actually public by default. Uh, so this amounts to almost nothing, but it's still a good idea in this case. Uh, there are many reasons for this. For example, uh, from the uh, perspective of being the library developer, uh, this is a recommendation by the uh, JetBrains coding conventions for libraries. Uh, they recommend that you make your public API explicitly public, even, even though it is the default. This helps you while maintaining your code since you are less likely to make accidental changes if your API, your public API is very explicitly public. You'll see this modifier in your code and you know that if you are making changes to this code, then you might be breaking uh, client code that's already existing out there and relying on this public API. As for the uh, client side, if your clients happen to jump into your source code, they will be uh, assured just one more time that you meant for these declarations to be public. They'll see that you have uh, designed your library. And of course, they will know that you are the sort of person who reads the official JetBrains coding conventions, which is always a plus. Uh, what have we achieved with all these changes? Uh, we can no longer publish our library, is what, what we have managed to achieve, uh, since it doesn't compile anymore. We are going to get a compile error uh, right there. Uh, anyone care to guess uh, what the problem here is? Any takers on that? Your actual data internal class and the user of the library won't be able to see it. Right. Uh, so what's happening is that we have this public function, which the clients are supposed to use, but then what we are returning from it is an internal type. So we are telling them to call this function, but whatever they are receiving as the result is a type that they aren't allowed to know about. So it wouldn't make sense uh, for this code to be uh, compiled, and the compiler, of course, prevents us from doing so. Uh, there, is, uh, there are multiple solutions to this. We could revert our uh, changes and make our private implementation public again, but of course this isn't what we uh, would, li would like to do. So instead, we can take a very object-oriented approach and introduce an interface. So we could create a public interface. This is the plan. And we create a public interface. We return, instead of the internal type, the public interface from the factory function. This interface can contain the get value and the set value methods. And of course, our delegate class could implement this interface. This would uh, solve our visibility troubles. Uh, the good news is that we don't have to define this interface ourselves. It actually ships in the Kotlin standard library, and it's very aptly named read-write property. 
it describes a uh, delegate which can be both read and written to. So uh, since we are now overriding methods, what we need to do is add these override keywords to both of our methods. And then the next thing that we should look at is the uh, type parameters of the interface, which it has actually two of. One of them is very straightforward. It's simply the type of the property that we are delegating to uh, this instance. This uh, naturally has to match the return type of the get value method and the parameter of the set value method. And then there is another type parameter in the interface, which is less obvious. And you can see that I have already put in our own create type here. So uh, what is uh, this type parameter then? This uh, type parameter actually restricts the uh, types of classes that this can be a delegate property in. So in this case, this will mean that the int delegate class can only be used within a create instance. And if we now look at the signature of both of our methods, there was this parameter here all along uh, called this ref, which had the completely meaningless type of nullable any. So we had no idea what we were receiving as a parameter. But now if we look at the declaration of the interface that we have just implemented, we'll see that these parameters actually have to match the first type parameter. So we are going to be receiving create instances in both of our methods. The natural question is, what create instance are we receiving as the parameter? And there would uh, be no sensible answer other, other than the create instance that our uh, current property delegate resides in. And we actually have a very good use for uh, this create instance that we have now received as a parameter. We can use it to uh, fetch the shared preferences instance in both of our methods. This will, of course, make the constructor parameter that we had so far uh, unused, so we can get rid of it and simplify our code to just this uh, rather simple implementation. And then the last step in this refactoring would be to uh, actually return this uh, public interface uh, from the factory function. Again, not only have we fixed our code, but we are uh, returning it a type here, which is a very well-known public type. Everyone already had it in their projects due to it being part of the standard library. And it describes our uh, delegate's purpose and uh, type exactly. Uh, you can see that it can be only used inside of a crate and that it can serve an integer uh, property. Right. Um, one more thing to note here. Uh, you probably see that the get value and set value methods have these non-trivial uh, signatures that you probably want, don't want to memorize yourself. So by uh, having this interface in the code, uh, what you can do when you are writing delegates is uh, implement this interface first and have your tooling uh, generate both of these overrides so that you don't have to uh, go to the documentation and copy paste the exact signatures. All right. Uh, so that was the easy part of our library. Uh, all of the primitive uh, types can be uh, implemented with delegates that look something like this. Uh, this was an integer, but the same would be uh, possible for booleans and strings and everything that uh, shared preferences supports uh, natively. However, uh, eventually there comes a time when people want to start storing more complex data, and uh, these people sometimes don't want to uh, put proper databases in their applications. So uh, what they uh, might choose to uh, ask you for is to support these types uh, within your shared preferences wrapper library, which uh, is exactly what happened. So uh, for our example here, we will look at how we may store a list of users, so a custom type inside shared preferences, even though it only supports primitives. So the way we decided to go about this is to uh, create a separate artifact, which isn't part of the core library, but you can edit your project uh, in addition to it, which is based on JSON and uh, serializes whatever uh, you are storing in the property uh, to a JSON representation, which uh, being a string can now be stored in shared preferences. So each time you write to this property, uh, your data will be serialized. And when you are reading, then uh, we'll read the string back from shared preferences and uh, deserialize it. Uh, one change that I'm going to make to this code, uh, just for simplicity's sake, is replace var with a val. 
Uh, so now the assignment that you see where we are assigning the list of users, of course, wouldn't compile as this is a read-only property. In reality, of course, uh, this uh, delegate would be just like the others, a var, so we would like to ideally write and read uh, values from our storage. But the interesting parts for us today will be just in the getter, and I get to show you something else uh, that uh, we would otherwise miss if we were to implement both the getter and setter. So keep in mind that in reality, we would, of course, obviously have a setter for this as well, but for the purpose of the talk, we'll just be uh, looking at the getters. So uh, let's jump into the implementation of uh, this delegate then. Uh, we won't do all the steps that we have already done with indelegate, so we'll use all of the knowledge that we have gathered and all of the design choices that we have already made. This class will be internal, uh, as it should be. It will receive just a key as its parameter, and it implements a public standard library interface, which is what I wanted to show you by uh, using just a val. Uh, there is a twin to the read-write property interface. If you wish to only support vals with your delegate, uh, for example, we could have uh, used this for lazy as well. Then instead of that interface, you can use the read-only property interface, which uh, is essentially the same interface without the set value method. So inside our method, uh, we of course will have to eventually return something of, of type T. The whole point is that we want to store any kind of uh, arbitrary generic data. And the way we do this is just like I've described earlier, we read first a string from shared preferences, then we create an instance of JSON and use it to deserialize the string. And the uh, way that we can tell JSON the type of object that, it's, that it uh, needs to construct from the string representation is by using a type token. And uh, again, lessons already learned. We'll introduce a factory function. It's an extension on the create type. And it returns the interface type. And all it does is pass on a key parameter and return an instance of the delegate class. So if we were to have written the set value method as well, then this code would compile. We could ship this, and users could uh, seemingly start using it. Uh, everything would uh, be fine at compile time, and everything would be fine if we had the setter uh, when people are writing custom types into this property. However, when they were to start reading it back, we would be uh, facing issues. Uh, specifically, they would be seeing class cost exceptions at runtime when they read this list of users and try to uh, actually call methods on, for example, their user instances. The question is, uh, why is this code broken? Why is the deserialization process uh, not working uh, properly? Why aren't they getting user instances? So the answer to uh, this riddle is type erasure, which is a well, feature, or more like a trait, of the JVM. To simplify it, what happens is that the uh, generics that we have in our code, both in Kotlin and in Java, are only checked at the source level at compile time. And then at runtime, they all get erased and essentially, simplified again, are all replaced by just objects. So anywhere where we had a generic type parameter, when it comes to runtime, we'll be seeing the java.lang.object uh, supertype and this is what's causing the trouble here. You can see that uh, when it comes to runtime, we are constructing a type token of objects. So instead of telling JSON to create a list of users for us, we are asking it to just return an object that happens to represent the string uh, that we have read somehow. And the way that JSON chooses to do this, if you ask it for an object, is to give you a very generic representation of the JSON structure that was contained in the string. So this will be a whole bunch of nested uh, maps and lists in our example. So when we actually call a user method on whatever objects it uh, returned to us, then uh, we'll get a runtime exception. So uh, going back to the real code, uh, what can we do about this? Uh, we are in luck. Kotlin has a feature which is meant for this exact purpose of keeping a generic type's concrete value at runtime, which is reification or the reified keyword. Uh, this keyword can be added to a type parameter, but it contains uh, several, it comes with several restrictions. Uh, for uh, for starters, we can't use it with our delegate class, as you might want to do initially. 
as it's not applicable in classes, it can only be used within functions. And furthermore, <coughs> the function needs to be in line for uh, reify to be allowed. So we also needed to add this identifier to the uh, function signature. We'll see uh, how this works in just a moment, but assuming that I am telling the truth and this actually makes the uh, concrete t-type available at runtime, how are we fixing our code later on? Well, what we may do in uh, this situation is construct the type token out here in the factory function while we still have the concrete value of the uh, type parameter. And instead of uh, constructing it in the class, we can take it as a parameter uh, to the delegate class. So uh, even though we would lose the type information if we were to do this inside of our class, in the factory function, we still have the concrete type and we should be fine. So why does this uh, reified keyword uh, fix our issues and how does it work? When you mark a function as inline, what essentially happens is that uh, at compile time, whatever is contained within the function gets, uh, well, copy pasted into your client's code. So when they refer to the gsmpref method within uh, migrate, that actually gets compiled to a call to the JSON delegate class constructor instead, which is the body of the JSON pref function. And any uh, parameters that need to be filled in uh, will of course uh, be done so. So for example, the key parameter, which was a string, uh, will be uh, filled in. And since we have marked our type parameter as reified, this parameter will be uh, available for us as well. So uh, you can see that in the compiled code of our clients, they will actually be creating a type token of a list of users. Uh, since at the call site, this type information is still present, uh, you can clearly see, uh, even in the source code, uh, that on the left side of the by keyword, the uh, type is uh, right there in the uh, properties uh, type declaration. So this is how, uh, at the call site, we can know this concrete type and uh, with reification, we can uh, move it into our own code, which is uh, in line right there. All right, uh, so with all of, the, all of this working, the question yet again, come, yet again comes up, uh, what's wrong with this code? Uh, I'll give you a hint, it doesn't compile for a reason. Any takers on this one now? It's not obvious. <laughs> okay. That's where the issue is. Uh, so uh, just like before, the uh, problem is around the uh, module boundaries. Uh, I've just described to you that what happens with the gsmpref uh, call that the clients are making in their source code is that when it gets compiled, it will uh, translate to a call to the uh, JSON delegate constructor. And even though this isn't source code, uh, this is uh, compiled code now, uh, this code is trying to cross module boundaries for a type that's internal. So our client, uh, uh, client's compiled code is trying to call into the internal class, which is in a different module. And this, of course, is still not allowed, even though uh, we are responsible for this type ending up there uh, due to uh, using it in an inline function. Uh, we could, again, revert our code and uh, undo everything, but there is a, fun a language feature to the rescue yet again, which is the published API uh, annotation. Uh, this annotation is designed for this exact situation. When you have an internal type in your module, which you wish to expose to client code, but not directly, only through inlining it uh, with uh, publicly accessible functions. So it will solve this exact situation. Clients kill, still uh, can't write uh, down the JSON delegate class name in their code. They can't refer to the type directly. However, they can be uh, free to use the JSONpref uh, function, which inlines the uh, JSON delegate calls uh, into their uh, compiled output. Uh, what's, what must be noted about this annotation is that whenever you mark an internal class with this, you now have to treat this declaration as if it was actually public. So even though source code doesn't refer to it, if clients already have compiled code, you can't make changes to this class's uh, signature and structure uh, within certain limitations uh, without breaking their already compiled code. Uh, this is a rather deep topic and uh, 
it has many impl implications and considerations to make. So instead of uh, trying to fit it into this presentation, I have uh, sat down a couple of weeks ago and wrote it all up. So you can uh, check this article out. I recommend this not only if you are uh, a library maintainer or developer, but also if you ever use Maven or Gradle dependencies in your projects, as these sort of uh, compatibility issues, especially in binary uh, formats, can uh, creep up on you even as just a client of libraries if you are uh, changing uh, and overriding uh, versions of uh, your dependencies. All right, uh, so getting back to our uh, original uh, sample of Crate, now that we have seen uh, some of the implementation. Uh, it's time for me to come clean about something, as I've been lying to you, this isn't our actual API, although it, it is close, uh, <coughs> close to it. Uh, let's uh, see why this API wouldn't make sense. So we have these three lines that are using our library. The first one is, fairly well defined. What we are trying to do is set a value in shared preferences. This is trivial to do. Uh, we understand what's happening here. But then in the second line, which is incrementing an integer in this case, uh, that's a complex operation. We first need to read the existing value, increment it, and then write it back, of course. And the last line, again, is just reading the uh, whatever existing value there is in the uh, create instance. And the question is, uh, what is the existing value of any of these properties if you have just written this code? So we could have chosen to uh, give implicit default values for each of the uh, delegates that we have implemented. So these could be false and zero and empty string, I suppose, by default. However, uh, these would be rather error prone and we wanted to avoid this. This was one of the main reasons why we chose to write a library for this ourselves. There are, of course, uh, other alternatives, uh, existing libraries that also use delegates and also wrap the shared preferences API, but I have uh, found that they don't make the distinctions uh, around empty values and defaults uh, clear enough. So let me tell you uh, what we have done. Uh, what we've done is that we have uh, two uh, variants of each of the types of delegates. So you can either provide an extra parameter which is uh, default value. This is just a name parameter for readability's sake. Of course, you could uh, drop the name there. So if you do choose to provide a default value, this uh, default is now explicit, so you won't be surprised when you uh, get it when your uh, properties haven't been written to yet. And uh, thanks to this, you will get a non-null uh, type for both of, these both of these properties, so a regular Boolean and a regular integer type. And then if you don't choose to uh, provide your defaults, then you will uh, be given a nullable property. Well, uh, naturally, uh, if you read it before writing a value, you will receive uh, null as the uh, return uh, value, which very clearly and uh, unambiguously signifies the absence of value uh, in this given property. And then just uh, one more uh, tip to take away. I would like to show you how we usually use this library in our projects. What we would do is uh, put an interface above uh, the concrete create instance. This interface would be uh, just listing all of our properties and we would override them using the uh, delegates that the create library provides. And what we would also do is make this whole thing in injectable uh, via dagger so that uh, the context is surely uh, already provided if you are using Dagger uh, in your application, so that's easy enough. And then if anyone needs to access these values, you can just inject the entire create class using the uh, app settings interface. All right, uh, to wrap things up, uh, I would of course very much like you to check out our library, uh, as you probably already figured out. Uh, read the source code as well and try using it as a client. Uh, we'd be happy to have any feedback on it, whether it didn't work for you, whether it did, uh, any feature request you would have, uh, please do try it. Then uh, this very talk uh, or a version of it will be on our blog as soon as I stop talking here and hit the publish button on it. So uh, do check that out and share it with anyone who uh, couldn't make it here today and you think would be interested in the topic. 
Then uh, there are the two links that were already within the slides uh, collected here so that you can uh, find them easily. And finally, uh, two more articles if you are interested in uh, either uh, library development in Kotlin or just general API design. Uh, these are things that you might wish to uh, read. And with that, if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. I have one question. Can you go back to the, the create definition, one of them? Um, sure, just a moment. Um, this one for you? Yeah, so... <laughs> oh, sorry. This one. Maybe this is not a good, good practice, but I can see an application here that they use the, the uh, property name as the key. Have you ever considered to drop the key as a string and just use the property name as a key uh, by default? Yes, uh, so you can actually do this. If we uh, look at the implementation, this is something that we have uh, considered. We'll go back to the simplest example. So in the case of the in delegate, uh, you do receive this second uh, parameter that I haven't talked about, which is a K property. This is a uh, Kotlin reflection type, which describes the property that you are delegating uh, to this class. And it has uh, a couple of properties that you can read from it. Uh, confusing uh, language due to things being overloaded. Anyhow, uh, one thing you can use this for is read the name of the property that you are uh, delegating. So if you were to, uh, instead of key, use property.name, you would get the same score string uh, since that was your uh, property's name in the first place. So this would avoid duplication. However, uh, things would, be, would start breaking if you were to use ProGuard, which is uh, why we didn't want to make this a default thing. We might still add it in some form later on. Uh, however, uh, on Android, the issue would be that uh, you would either have to keep all of your classes that are crates uh, so that the names don't change, uh, or if you uh, wouldn't do this, then uh, ProGuard might name the properties uh, different uh, names uh, in different builds of your applications. So the key would change and you would be losing your values in shared preferences. But yes, uh, for there are use cases where uh, read, using this property is very useful. I just uh, didn't, want to, uh, didn't want to do it in uh, this case due to mostly obfuscation. Okay, thanks. Great question though, thank you. Anyone else? If I have multiple crates and both of them define a score, then they will override each other, right? Yes, uh, by default they will. Uh, there was this uh, simple crate implementation in the beginning, uh, like right here. So what we are, what I've shown you here is just opening the default shared preferences instance uh, using the context that was passed in. This is actually a simplified version of our library's code. The actual simple create class has an extra parameter, which is the name of the shared preferences to open. Uh, this is actually a nullable parameter, so if you don't provide a name, then we'll be using the default shared preferences. But if you do, then you can uh, use a different shared preferences <laughs> instance for each of your crates. And you may also override the interface directly uh, should you need to do it. But simple create solves most of the cases as well. Anyone else? All right, I'll be here afterwards anyway. So if anyone happens to come up with questions, feel free to ask them later on. Uh, so thank you.